right. Just so I wanted to continue some of the dialogue, actually, that uh, uh, that Brian just touched on. And I want to talk about the game within the game. And before we get into the game within the game, I just wanted to share this disclaimer. If you could review this, if you're uh, live today or if we're watching any of the recordings. But let's get into this. So we're, we're going to talk for about 25 minutes uh, and with about 15 minutes of Q&A. But the first question I want to start off with is how many 10 baggers or 100 baggers do you need in your lifetime? And my answer to that is actually not many or even none. It really depends on your strategy. So the first thing I will say is the, the land of the 100x is this proof of concept stage on business lifecycle. It's venture type investing in public markets or it's turnaround strategies. They're vastly different than the 10x strategies, which is more growth equity like. There's a handful of strategies in there. In fact, there's only three that we think persist in that 10x type uh, strategy. We focus on what we call uh, growth equity. It's a very specific type of growth equity uh, that I'll touch upon later. So the two central questions I want to focus this conversation around is, can you hunt these big inefficiencies and can you repetitively exploit them? And then the second question is, can you actually survive the ride? To capture a 10 or 100X, you need to be able to endure tremendous amounts of volatility and be engaged for five to 10 years. So the three topics I wanna to touch on is actionable volatility, the second is hunting early stage horses. I'll explain what that is in a minute. And then the third is surviving the volatility. So about 15 years ago, I stepped back, I've uh, been in this business for over 20 years now. And I said, how do you systematically break down a vast universe of investment opportunities and break it down to, to a very rich group of, of opportunities that can generate sustainable superior returns? The real question I had was how do you maximize your return on time? Time is by a mile our scarcest um, commodity in this business. How do we focus it on very rich idea generation and exploitation? And so here's where it started. And this is my firm, Aravat Global, is a $500 million fund based in Manhattan. Um, we focus on one very specific strategy I'll get into in a minute. But um, when I was at Ziff Brothers, this is one of the things I focused on, was just like, let's break down the base rate for the left and the right tail. And here's what we discovered. And this is we, we do uh, mainly mid cap and large cap. We've, we've had a, a very exciting and prosperous adventure now into, into SMID cap uh, for reasons I'll explain in a minute. But here's the base rate for above $2 billion market cap in the United States. This is a study from 1990 through 2016. And so here's the base rate of 20% stock compounders on the left side over 10 year rolling cohorts, about 3% of companies could do it. And then the right side here is about is uh, five-year rolling cohorts or about 14% of companies could do it. What we did is we took this data set and we broke it down. We said, what were the specific historical patterns, the mathematical tautologies that enabled this type of return and literally did hundreds and hundreds of case studies. There are three strategies that could do it. We're gonna focus on one. We launched with three. We believe only one matters in the five and 10 year plus duration hunt for uh, extreme performance. So here's what we do. We focus on one strategy. We call them horses. We do it across all uh, market cap zones. They are specifically monopolies and oligopolies that can compound earnings per share at, at much more briskly than the market can for long periods of time and trade at what we believe are reasonable prices. We focus on what we call unfair fights. Um, we don't like competition. We believe competition is great for the consumer. We don't believe it's great for capitalists. And the most important decision we made in focusing on unfair fights and monopolies in particular is you will do hundreds, if not thousands of hours of work on individual positions. If they're not monopolistic or oligopolistic or highly advantaged business models, the link between your historical analysis and your projection of future in order to arbitrage price, that link is actually very weak. And so this one uh, really important notion for us on focusing on, on pricing inefficiencies of monopolies and oligopolies has helped us exploit all the volatility and stay engaged in highly volatile situations for long periods of time, which we'll explore today. So this is our true north. And um, we believe over time that intrinsic value and price converge, specifically earnings per share or free cash flow per share in more mature states, sales and, and, gross, and gross profits can drive it in the interim and price will eventually converge. We have no idea when, but we believe over time that value and price will drive it. That's the most important driver of, of uh, long-term stock performance. And if we have the ability to project um, with confidence that price and intrinsic value, sorry, that intrinsic value will compound at a brisk rate over long periods of time, we're in a great position. 
So the business life cycle was touched on briefly in the prior uh, talk. This is really important to us. There are three stages that we describe in the business life cycle for any single company. It's called proof of concept, replication, and maturation or decline. We focus our business model on the replication phase. These are businesses that have won their niches. They're, the relative size of the niche to the company is, is very large in the hands of capable managers. And we are in the replication or scaling business. That's what we focus on. Within microcap and, and smidcap, there are more mix of proof of concept and replication. This is, again, where the game within the game. We believe the replication phase within microcap is very exploitable. Proof of concept in either microcap, smidcap, or even large cap is a much wider dispersion environment that's harder to call. So our adventure into smidcap and some of our key findings. First of all, um, there is intense capital um, demand right now for private companies. And the market, uh, even in private in the United States, is now, in our, in our view, getting very, very hot. The competition is very hot. What we found in SMIDCAP, both domestically and internationally, it's a very inefficient market for a lot of the obvious reasons, which we'll get into very shortly. The second is we believe both tails are in play in the distribution of outcome of stocks. We'll share some SKU statistics with you in a minute. But a lot of businesses that frankly shouldn't be listed or are ill-formed really shouldn't be in the public domain and a lot of extraordinary businesses that can compound at risk rates for extremely long period of time. There's lots of what we call proof of concept businesses. That's really seed or turnaround style of investing, venture type investing in public markets, but also a surprising number of oligopolies and monopolies, which we believe are in the growth equity type return and very healthy returns with liquidity. So there's actually been much fewer business trade-offs than we expected. In our hunt for monopolies and oligopolies within micro and SMID, there's been most importantly, virtually no uh, low to no regulatory risk, which in the current domain globally, we think is quite important. We believe that small does not equal immature. There are many of these businesses that have been around for many years and have demonstrated to us all the characteristics of a very strong business uh, that can compound for a long period of time. And then finally, we found a large number of highly talented owner operators that are super aligned with our objectives. We've been very pleasantly surprised about the quality that we've found that can generate private market type returns within the public domain globally. So first of all, know your terrain. Um, I don't think there's anything small about microcap investing. In fact, I think it's almost all extremes. The first being obviously an enormous investment universe, which you need to funnel at the top of the funnel into a finite game within the game. How do you sift through it? The second then is a massive outcome distribution. It's the widest of all the deciles uh, within uh, all market cap zones um, in the world. Third is a wide uh, a wild, excuse me, return skew. What I define that as is based to risk in the way that we invest, but also in outcomes of the left tail, the mean and median, and then the right tail. In uh, the micro cap zone, you have by far the widest set of alpha to be able to exploit. And then the final part of this is bone crunching volatility. I think some of the greatest vol monsters uh, are amongst this crew listening today. Uh, you handle levels of volatility, which frankly uh, would make most of us blush. So let me start with game selection. We believe this is the most important thing um, that you do as a leader and as an investor. And that starts with choosing the difference between efficient and inefficient markets. Where do you hunt? And the whole goal here is to compete in less efficient markets or markets that you can extract profits from repetitively um, and comfortably within your skill set. So let's start with the definition of efficient versus inefficient markets. Our definition of an efficient market is that no one can consistently win. And what we mean by that is two things. One is if it's an edge, if you had an edge, the edge disappears extremely quickly because it's too competitive, or frankly, it is unknowable. So there is no arbitrage between what you think and market pricing. An inefficient market is one that actually profits can be extracted repetitively over time. Now, this is quite distinct from what we call competitive versus uncompetitive markets, which often gets conflated. Competitive markets are hyper-liquid markets, US global large cap, global macro. And then uncompetitive or less competitive markets, including micro cap, frontier markets, and technical markets. Now, how do these two overlap? So first thing is that's important is you can have inefficiency and efficiency in both large uh, competitive and less competitive markets. The question is what drives it? 
So in the large US uh, large cap markets and the competitive or hyper liquid markets, the inefficient markets in that top right corner are more temporal in nature. They're not structural. Why? Because every institution in the world, the banks, et cetera, are, are combing over all of those opportunities and analyzing them in depth. However, there is always times when they are chronically mispriced. And those times you need to be set up for to be able to exploit those temporal or short-term inefficiencies, and they happen all the time. The second part here is the less competitive, including microcap and frontier markets. The difference between the inefficient and efficient markets is there are structurally inefficient pricing zones within uh, the less competitive markets, and that's where we wanna be spending our time. Efficient zones within the microcap zone there is an enormous universe of stocks, which frankly are completely uncallable and require a very industrial, different industrial design if you choose to pursue them. So this is a data set of all US listed stocks from 1990 through 2016. And what I wanted to share with you here is the annual and decade level distributions of what SKU looks like. And again, SKU for us, this is the outcome SKU as opposed to the prospective SKU of actually every single security on the left side here is annual over that 26 year period. The right side is rolling decades um, on what those outcomes looked like. And so this is every security. This is not just for micro cap. And the whole point of this here is on a one year skew, it does look like a more a normal distribution curve. There is some exponential uh, outcomes, exponent outcomes on that first annual period. And on the second one is this gives, as you hold things for a longer period of time, the number of zeros starts appearing, but you also start dragging out that right tail. So now let's look at what actually microcap um, does in the available alpha within microcap. So on the first of all, the setup here is each of these rows is the decile of the market cap zones uh, within the market over that 26 year period. Microcap is decile one, mega cap is decile 10. The point here is skew is dramatic in the micro cap zone and skewness is actually inversely, uh, it varies inversely with market cap. So the smaller the market cap, the more extreme skew, the skew is defined here as the difference between mean and medium. And so the first red bubble on the top there in, in, that, in that top decile, the mean median split over that 26 year period is over 1100 basis points. For mega cap, it's, two, it's 200, sorry, it's 2.6%. It's, uh, it's um, the second point in here is the, on that far right column is the percentage of those listed securities over these are rolling decade cohorts that generated any positive return and only 43% in, in micro cap delivered any positive return over rolling decades, about 80% of mega cap could do it. The point here being there is a lot of businesses of business failure, stock failure and business failure uh, in that micro cap zone, but there's a dramatic divergence between the winners and the average. And so micro cap in our view is a stock picker's dream, but you better know what you're doing. So on volatility, this is a really important concept I wanna make sure we anchor into and in our approach to exploiting price volatility. So the first thing is I wanna separate out business volatility from price volatility. The two concepts are vastly different. And in the business of arbitrage, our job is to exploit price versus our assessment of value. In SMID and microcap, both are higher. And so one of our jobs is knowing the difference between opportunity and risk. The simple chart set up here in that orange line is intrinsic value variation. The dark black line here is price. Just because prices go up and down doesn't mean, it, mean it's exploitable volatility. When both business volatility and price volatility are fluxing at the same time, arbitrage is extremely difficult. We try to focus on situations, and we'll explain in a minute, on more business stable situations where we have the ability to project and let price come to us. So the whole goal here is to hunt inefficiency or what we call exploitable volatility. The setup in this chart in the y-axis is business predictability. The x-axis here is price volatility. The target zone here, when you have a highly or higher predictable business, for us, monopolies and oligopolies, price volatility is your friend. In fact, the more volatile, the better. When the business quality is really high and price volatility is lower, the available alpha, and I'm not even talking about just trading strategies, this is your ability to have more shots on goal to size your positions. Your alpha is a little smaller when price volatility is lower. Now, if business predictability is very low, and what we call again is that's in the proof of concept stage of the business or lower business quality, when you have high pricing volatility and low business predictability, 
my goodness, that is a hard place for an investor and an analyst to live. And then finally, if you're living in the low, low phase, I'm not really sure what you're doing. So what is high and low prediction? To be able to actually predict outcomes and arbitrage price, it really matters. Is it a high or low prediction environment that you're living in? For a low prediction environment, what we call here is there's a weak link between the past and the future. So for example, flipping coins, you know the base rate is 50-50. However, one head does not matter, doesn't tell you anything about what the next toss will be. The next environment here is a high prediction environment where there is a strong relationship between historical results and what future projection. For us, that's subscription businesses and annuities. This is where we focus. And so game selection makes volatility your friend. If you operate in a high prediction environment, the left side here, price volatility, that's that blue line in the squiggle, and the intrinsic value is relatively steady and increasing over time, that's that dark black line, now price volatility is, first of all, you can survive it and then you can exploit it. So for us, we, just, we term higher prediction environments to be subscription businesses, annuities, or monopolies. A lower prediction environment is where both business and price are fluxing at the same time. These are highly competitive industries. They're commodities. It's just, it's 3D chess to us. It's extremely difficult environment to arbitrage consistently over time. So I wanted to talk about the power of transitions. Um, transitions generate very high short-term alpha. It's very trading intensive. And this, this is not the source of long-term compounding. However, the greatest alpha explosions in all of our studies typically exist in those transitions. They come from imminent bankruptcies going to a survival stage. Uh, they go from uh, l l poorer quality to less bad. Uh, they go from entering a recession to exiting it, and they go from cyclical businesses to less cyclical businesses. Any of these transitions, generally speaking, uh, results in an alpha explosion. The issue is lower quality businesses have very wide uh, outcome spans, which are frankly less callable, and henceforth extremely wide return dispersion. So the question is not, is there available alpha? It's whether it's exploitable repetitively. And so the question for us is, this strategy is of transitions, it's harder to scale and size. It's in our terminology, a lower prediction environment. So why does that matter? Oops, okay. So I got a great question in preparation of this, of how do you know uh, a monopoly in transition or in the making? And frankly, coming back to this 100X versus 10X paradigm, the 100X is the land of venture, the land of proof of concept, the land of turnaround. Um, scaling monopolies is once the monopoly is set and they have won, it's a question of how big can they win. And so the approach between these two really depends upon your skill set, price, and liquidity. Um, but there are things that, 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 frankly, you need to pay attention to. So monopolies in the making, frankly, there's rarely a single point of inflection. It's very wide dispersion until reached. Um, and it's just very, very hard to call. Scaling monopolies, on the other hand, we believe this is a huge opportunity if you can execute it. And it also asks questions from our perspective that we think are far more answerable and frankly, equally lucrative. So from a risk perspective, I think this is important to highlight. It's a vastly different risk design and approach for surviving and monetizing the ride phase uh, when you're exiting proof of concept and going into replication. In proof of concept, the business volatility is still high. It's, almost it's, more, it's actually very important to average up, not down. And we think the signal between price volatility and business volatility, most of the time the price signal can't, that there is no signal in price when you're in the proof of concept stage. Very, very dangerous. You have to sit and you have to observe. In the replication phase, we are now observing, we are no longer predicting. These businesses have won. And now price volatility, up or down, frankly, is actionable because it depends now on a higher predictive prediction environment that we can assess a value of a company and if it's getting, if it's the decision trees are breaking to the reward case, we don't mind averaging up. Or if the price is going down, but nothing's changed, we can increase sizing as price comes to us. So it also in industrial design, I think it's really important to highlight that the setup of if you're hunting in uh, micro cap, because the right tail is fully in play, and if you're actually skilled at finding rapid durable compounders, 
wow, SKU is so in your advantage in your, in your portfolio design. So the setup here is a 20 position portfolio. What was the returns over a 10 year holding period from a CAGA and a MOIC perspective? And what I can tell you is if you run this sensitivity yourself, which I would encourage a very quick model to, to build in, in Excel, if you have one third of your positions go to zero, but one third generates market returns and one third generates 30% compounded returns, you can still deliver 17% gross unlevered returns or five times your capital. Now that's assuming that one third of your positions went to zero. Um, this is only assuming that you hit your base case one third of the time. The point here is there's really only two sensitivities that drive the outcome when you have this level of skew in, your, um, in the market that you hunt. The first is what is your level of skill? So the, the number of positions that hit your base case underwriting, this is only assuming one third does it. And the second is, are they actually compounding at a brisk rate or not? Which 30% compounders in your zone is highly doable as your base rate has already shown you. Frankly, the most important insight from here is it's really not that sensitive to the one third mistakes that you make because of the skew that exists in your market structure. So here's a couple of our SMIDCAP uh, names that you know, we've had the great pleasure of partnering with and have been fruitful for us. The first is Keyword Studios. Uh, this is the largest outsourced uh, sub, uh, vendor supplier to the video game industry listed in the United Kingdom. The second here is Temple and Webster. It is the Wayfair of Australia in a far better market structure. And then Semler Scientific, which is a med tech company based in the United States with some of the best SaaS type economics we've ever seen. Um, and, uh, you know, delivering it on a single product at the moment. We believe there's multiple shots on goal in a very large TAM. What we've been really pleasantly surprised is first of all, that we've found many businesses now that have the monopolistic and oligopolistic characteristics that we enjoy in mid cap and large cap in the SMID cap zone. And even in micro cap, we believe they do exist. Um, the second is in international markets, we believe that that, that that area is even more bountiful. The United States as mentioned before, has a lot of private capital that would have kept most of these businesses private for longer periods of time. We have the great pleasure of actually studying them in the public domain with far more data. And these are quite mature businesses that are growing now with liquidity. And these are businesses, frankly, in the United States, we wouldn't see until they're, they're much more mature and frankly, a lot more expensive. So last part of this conversation is around surviving volatility. Now, this is a base rate for above $2 billion market cap, and this is the base rate for the right tail. So we've studied literally hundreds of 20% plus compounders. And what we can tell is, 15% drawdowns all the time. For you micro cap investors, this is, doesn't even move your dial. 20% drawdowns most years and a down 50 at least once every single decade. Again, this is the base rate for the right, right tail. This is not even the base rate for the average. We can't predict when they occur, but we are not at all surprised. Now, Amazon, one of the greatest stocks, obviously, of our generation. This is Amazon's uh, volatility over the past decade. It's compounded at 30%. About 34% of the time it's spent below that 10%, sorry, 10% or below um, its all-time highs, about 12% of the time below 20% from its all-time highs and a max drawdown of one third. However, let's stretch it out into the monopoly in the making in its entire life cycle. And then when it was scaling its monopoly, the vol characteristics, the drawdown characteristics are much wilder. Um, you'll see, you know, here again on the left side, it wasn't just uh, the, the dot-com bust that created it, Amazon had experienced some really violent uh, um, drawdowns during that entire period. And then, and then its volatility characteristics, frankly, fundamentally changed when uh, the monopoly was quite well established. As we pan out and look at the, the adventure of Amazon, left side here is its life to date chart. And then the right side there was, the, was the, G, the GFC drawdown. The left side here in that proof of concept stage was really violent, but frankly, in the lifetime of return, fairly noted, you can't even see it now when you pan out. By the time you got into that green part of this, this is all scaling of the monopoly. There is tremendous evidence on, on the quality of the moat, the size of the TAM, the quality of the management team and its ability to scale its unit economics. There's a whole slew of things now which are observable as opposed to what you had to predict in that proof of concept stage. Proof of concept still has tremendous power of order of magnitude returns. But once you get into that replication phase of monopolies and oligopolies, there's just a tremendous amount of value to be created, but it still it has to endure moments of complete panic. And that's what that red line is 
when you have these massive drawdowns, whether it's systemic or idiosyncratic in nature, it's just an inevitable part of the ride. And this is nothing unique to Amazon. This is Costco just below it. Costco experienced the exact same thing. So uh, as we start to wrap up here, a couple of things or tips for each of you to survive the volatility. And again, survival is the most important imperative here. To survive volatility, four things we'll share with you. One is just be aware of the base rate. It's going to happen. It's a natural part of the ride. It's an inevitable. It's the cost of high performance and the provider of it. The second is choose a game that gives you a chance to survive that volatility and or exploit it. The third is there is tremendous difference between marking risk and permanent capital loss. We're obviously in the business. We define risk as permanent capital loss. Just because price action varies around doesn't make it actionable. And that's the last point. Our protocol, when we're heavily sized, we run a concentrated portfolio. The average top 10 of our portfolio is between 80 and 90%. We hold through. We don't necessarily add down. If we have the dry powder to rotate, we will. But the first imperative into a highly volatile environment is ride through it, not necessarily trade it. And so the final part of this is these are my personal sources of strength. The first and most important one when the, when the stress is high is I trust my team. I've, I'm very blessed that I have uh, an investment team that's been with me for a very long period of time. We've been, trust, we've been tested through many volatile situations. If you don't trust your team and the quality of work, it's very hard to endure any forms of volatility. It will shake out weak hands. The second then is the quality of the business. If the business moats hold and price uh, moves 50%, you sleep very, very well. Um, the same thesis that we underwrote is still the projected, the, the flow through rates may change, but the business quality is an enormous uh, source of strength and comfort for us. The third one then is the quality of the teams that we, that we partner with. When you find great businesses that are being managed by great teams, focus on the business now. Even when the price volatility comes to you, that's what will let you endure for really long periods of time. And then finally, there was much talked about valuation prior to this. In our view, it really only tells you how much you're going to make. It really doesn't tell you anything about protection. And then in closing, uh, these are some of the places that you can find me. Um, if you find a microcap horse, please give us a call. We'd, we'd love to ride them with you. Um, we're very happy to share uh, our approach to all of this. Um, and as Ian touched on before, um, it's an honor to be able to share some insights and, and our thoughts with, uh, with this community. And you can find them both on YouTube and in Twitter. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you for that excellent presentation, Yen. Very well done, as usual. Um, you know, maybe I'll just get things kickstarted. And actually, before I, I ask my question, just a reminder, if people have questions, feel free to ask them using the Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Um, you know, now that you're kind of going downstream into small caps and even micro cap, I'm curious, maybe first, maybe tell us a little bit more about your research process, because you've, you've let me under the hood a little bit of your firm, and it's been really impressive, the types of research that you do internally. I mean, I was blown away by it. And, you know, and also maybe then go, then also illustrate, you know, kind of how that has to evolve as you go downstream, if it does at all. Um, it's a great, great question, Ian. Um, there's a couple, there's, I, I've been surprised on, um, frankly, how little compromises we've had to make in our research process and the quality of the businesses or teams that we've, we've laid out. I think the single biggest area that we probably, uh, that will differ, the approach is the same, the data points by and large or less. And so we have to infer a little bit more than we typically would in, in mid cap or mega cap. And by the way, the, the, the absolute sweet spot in history for um, you know, right tail compounders has always been in the sub $5 billion to sub $10 billion range. The, the lower you can start, obviously, the longer the ride. Uh, but the biggest difference we've had to make in our process is we just have less data points to be able to assess. It makes us dig a little bit harder. And frankly, that's one of the four key edges in this business. Informational edge, I really do believe exists in micro cap. I don't believe it exists at all in mega cap. Um, and so, you know, that probably the single hardest area for us um, in, in uh, micro or smid cap is management team evaluation. We don't have um, generally speaking, the wide enough network uh, around those individuals to triangulate to the same level that we would normally do. But I would have to say in general, um, the research process, first of all, is identical, but just the data points is, is a little bit less. Um, and I would also add on that, when you start that much smaller, you can average up as you learn more. And so you don't have to load everything in the first day. 
um, it, the story usually unfolds. And uh, that's been one of the beautiful parts in some of these uh, much um, you know, smaller companies is when the relative size of the TAM to the company is so enormous and it's in the hands of a great team, it doesn't matter if you start small and you load over a year or two or three, there's just still so much upside to be able to uh, de-risk or risk up your, your thesis. So what types of industries or um, companies do you look for, given that you're looking for this replication? So um, and we've studied where all these horses have lived in, uh, you know, globally and, and, uh, um, and by sector. And there are some natural market uh, structures that lend themselves to long duration compounding. Um, and we are more, uh, I prefer clusters versus just single idiosyncratic uh, companies, we do both, but I would have a stronger tendency for, for clusters that just designs an industry structure that's highly conducive uh, to long-term compounding. Um, and, it, and so frankly, you know, there's, no, there's no, uh, nothing new that should be surprising to people, but um, technology, uh, TMT has been a rich area. Um, healthcare has been a rich area, it's a very sub part of industrials, a uh, very sub part of consumer this is where, again, comes back to the game within the game. There are, within every industry, there are sub pockets of it that are highly lucrative. And frankly, it doesn't require a lot of imagination. You just need to be very observant because we're looking for persistency in high performance. We're not looking for inflection. And so the assessment that we need to make, we exploit fade rates. Like the businesses that we buy, they're still compounding at a brisk rate the unit economics still hold, their ability to reinvest capital still holds. And the market in general, because it's only 3% of securities that can do 20% or more, is constantly mean reverting everything else. Our businesses are fighting mean reversion. They're fighting the fade rate on literally every metric that matters. So the game within the game just tells you every sector is in play. Business services has phenomenal stuff. You just need to be able to find within each pocket what businesses are either um, exiting that proof of concept stage, but most importantly, into great market structures that enable very lucrative return on capital once dominance is fully exercised and exploited over long periods of time. So what type of concentration um, or diversification does your fund have? Do you like, you know, in the 10 to 20 companies or what, what kind of range? Uh, so we hold uh, 20 positions in our um, long portfolio. Uh, the concentration, we prefer our top 10. Uh, we run a levered long book in our long short portfolio. We run a mildly levered portfolio in our long only portfolio. Our preferred top 10 is somewhere in that order of 80, almost 90% of equity. They will naturally find themselves up. Even the game selection of monopolies and oligopolies has an error rate to it. And we're talking about mid cap and mega cap. In micro cap, again, much wider variance, very, very difficult to call these at inception, they generally will find you and, and size themselves back up if you, if you give them the chance to breathe. And again, I think there's too much focus on the hunt and the, the next shiny thing and the idea. The ride is absolutely critical. If you, can't, if you can find 10 baggers and 100 baggers, but you only get 2x, 3x, 4x out of them, you'll do okay, but you'll do a fraction of what you're capable of doing. You need to really focus hard on your ability to stay sized for long periods of time. And I believe that's both the function, again, of game selection and actually understanding the types of volatility that you can withstand personally, but most importantly, why. What is your approach to selling a position or what are the factors that you, know, you use to the, go into that decision? So there are four reasons that we sell. The first and easiest one is, well, actually, it's not always easy, is that you're wrong. Actually, the hardest part within that is when you don't even know you're wrong. So, you know, but let's just put that one out there. So the first one clearly is you're wrong. The second one is uh, you're paid for your thesis. Now, this is a little bit more complicated with high quality growth stocks. High quality growth stocks, you need to give them a significant amount of room. Otherwise, you can't capture the multi-bagger potential of that, of that total return. That is an art unto itself that we can spend a lot of time on, quite frankly. The third one then is the relative um, fight for capital. We call them thunderdomes, where you put two stocks in, only one stock comes out, where the, the, the opportunity cost of capital 
uh, exceeds what we believe is the, the projected five-year return on that single stock. And then finally, by the way, that one should be used very sparingly. It's false precision in my view. Most of the time, the Thunderdomes occur. You have to be very careful because this is pen, this is crayon level. It's not you know Excel level of precision in my view when you're talking about high quality businesses over five and ten year time periods. And then the final one is if you if you've breached risk limits, uh, those are the, those are the four reasons that we sell, Mike. Thank you. And um, what's what's your holding period look like typically? Our preferred holding period is forever. We're a seven and a half year old firm. About a third of our assets are as old as we are. About about a third of our assets now are between three and five years old. And then there's a fresh cohort that's about a third of the assets in sub two years right now. But our holding period we prefer is forever. And within that, um, what lets you hold forever is the intrinsic value compounding of your assets has to be exceeding your cost of capital for a long, long period of time. Otherwise, by definition, you need to add value through trading. And that's one of the entry, there's, there's eight factors that we look for in all of our, our horses. And if the growth algorithm doesn't create value at substantially above our cost of capital, which is 20%, we don't, uh, we don't engage. We want the optionality of forever. Our preferred time holding period is forever. So we had an attendee asking, um, uh, could you talk about uh, idea sourcing, especially for SMIDs and how do you ultimately size your positions? Um, so uh, sourcing uh, is exactly the same way that we do for all market cap zones. Um, there's, there's some algorithmic components to this, which just are mathematically tautological to the way that we invest. If businesses can't grow revenues um, at a certain level, if they don't have unit economic stability at a certain level that we can predict, um, they can be screened out fairly quickly. So we have both quantitative and qualitative screens. We read a tremendous amount. Um, what we do is a very um, small part of the, of the market at large. Again, I believe excellence in all its forms is a game within the game. I think the addressable universe for what we do is, is you know, less than a couple of hundred stocks globally. We would, agree, we would believe on, on, a, on the 2 billion and above zone in micro cap and in SMID cap, uh, that number probably is that again. Um, but we keep a list of things that we keep finding. And we have actually three portfolios in the way we design it. Um, the live portfolio is book one, the backup portfolio is book two, and then a curated research inventory is book three. But our sourcing again is we can actually quantify like through quant screens find these. That's actually not that difficult. The second one is then doing a tremendous amount of reading to validate those inputs. Um, and we can get to uh, a, a pretty quick uh, go, no go on each of those uh, in fairly short order. Sizing. So that's a great question. And this is hyper personal to everybody. Um, our preferred sizing is we do it in, and it depends again on liquidity to some degree for us. Uh, we have uh, liquidity budgets also within our, our portfolio. There's risk budgets for everything. Uh, but we are three, five, seven, and 10 is the general path that we go in 12. Uh, these are all last dollar in, and then we'll let them run. So we very rarely do three to be fully clear, but three, if we're starting it on its way to, to five, we prefer to start at five. Uh, we love seven. We're almost completely indifferent at seven. Uh, there's, there, we can handle an unbelievable amount of volatility at seven. There's a fight for capital once you start getting in that 10 and 12 range, and we're happy going to 20. How do you know when a company has a blip in fundamental performance versus the business is changing for the worse? Um, phenomenal question, and this is why we probably will not be AI'd. Um, this is where the qualitative research and judgment really matters. First of all, you've got to know where to focus and what the early signs of it are. Um, and so moat cracking leaves, a you can see there's some very clear things that we look at that tell us that the cracks are appearing. And there's three parts in particular that we look for. Um, and then the second part of that is how it gets manifested. So business fundamentals, first of all, there is tremendous business variance quarter to quarter. And, and we don't try to predict that. Like, frankly, it's easier for us to predict three or five years out than it is for us to predict three or five weeks or months out. And if you grip it too hard, there's no chance that you can uh, navigate this to a five or 10 year win. Um, so that's point one, business and life is not that clean, can't be modeled that cleanly. Monopolies and oligopolies, the market positioning is really strong. The throughput rate is not fully knowable to such a, a tight band of, um, of precision. So how do we know the difference between business fundamentals and something categorically going wrong? You need to know what the KPIs of each business model are. And within the KPIs, then you can start looking for the first or second derivative of anything going wrong. It's not a number. It's just a number will alert you 
to where you need to focus your resources. And so we have a general feel for where, you know, general moat cracks start appearing, but the KPIs for every single firm in each industry are different that would lead you down that track. And um, no single thing, this is again, you know, it's an art and a science, um, the art part of this is having the judgment when those small cracks appear, are they fishes for larger cracks or are they temporal in nature? That's the whole judgment part of the business. But I do believe knowing where to look is knowable in advance and then judgment on what do you do about it. In a world with increasing innovation, how do you judge the ability of a company to protect its monopoly or, or oligopoly and not become disrupted? Uh, it's a great question. So moats only last as long as a business cycle and business cycles have to be defined by when the technological shift, the basis of competition shifts. So by definition, technology moats uh, in general are shorter. However, some of the moats in technology are extraordinarily large. So I'll contrast this. Analog moats in general up till recently are extremely long dated. So if it's an engineering product, uh, we own um, and have been you know, a very... Um, uh, grateful shareholders of Transdime. Transdime makes aftermarket parts uh, for aerospace. 90% uh, of its products have no second source to them. For them to be displaced requires a whole new platform of airplanes. You contrast that. So that's an analog moat. The cycle, the business cycle is that life of that entire plane platform. For technology, the question is, what is the relevant business life cycle? For example, when mobile arrived, when, des when there was a transition from desktop to mobile, the business life cycle completely changed because the basis of competition changed in consumer internet from desktop to mobile. So the moats completely got disrupted by that. The question is what's next after mobile that would disrupt it if that's one of the approaches. But the, again, the way that we define, especially in technology, is if it's a cloud business, what's gonna displace cloud, right? It has to be so superior that that's what will displace in technology the existing mode. But we think of this in business life cycles and it's defined by, again, what's the basis of competition that's relevant for that industry. When, when you look at business moving out of the proof of concept stage into that replication stage, um, how, how do you define that transition? And is that the point where you actually attempt to invest in or do you try to wait a little longer after that, that inflection point? Um, there is no single inflection point. And frankly, we don't even try. Uh, because if, if businesses are, have monopolistic or oligopolistic characteristics and the TAMs are big, you can still wait for a while and make an un unbelievable amount of money. And frankly, risk adjusted, it's so much easier. So you know, it's nice to be able to say at a cocktail party, you had a 50 or 100x. How much did you size it and how many losses were occurred in it? You can take a lot of losses for each 50 or 100x if you actually can ride it. Um, but by definition, to get to the 50 or, or 100x, you're actually already into the replication phase. So for us, this is where, you, you know, it comes to the difference between predicting a monopoly and oligopoly versus observing a monopoly and oligopoly. And there's one other really critical factor here. Just because you have a phenomenal business on your hands, does not mean that this management team can scale the asset, right? There's countless times that we've seen high quality businesses run into the ground by management teams that don't really understand the model or frankly didn't have the operating skill to scale the asset. So our skill as investors is we're focused on the scaling stage of monopoly oligopoly growth stocks in specific sectors where we think there's just lots of them. But again, to answer the question point blank, we don't even try to stand on top of the point where it's proof of concept into replication. If you can catch it, amazing, but you don't need to. So how do you go about identifying a moat? What, what are the key factors you look at? And are there, are there any, you know, like financial metrics or whatever you might use in part of that? Absolutely. So this took me 15 years and I'll save you the 15 years. There's three things that I've found that tell me they exist, but it doesn't tell me what exactly is the root of it. So the three outputs, first one is a high competitive win rate. We back unfair fights. Our businesses just win a lot more than they lose. By the way, if it's hard for them to win, it's not a very attractive business for us. So two parts to that. 
high competitive win rate for a new business. The second is high customer retention. You can't compound if you can't keep your existing um, base of customers. So the most important part of this is we call it again, an unfair fight. Advantaged businesses just win a lot more than they lose. Second one is gross margin stability mix adjusted for the business. The most important part of owning a monopoly is having pricing power. If you don't have pricing power, it's a monopoly not worth having. And then the third part of this is high returns on incremental capital. The compounding machine requires capital being deployed at high rates of return constantly for IRR to be converted to CAGR, to be converted to MOIC. So that last part, if, if, the, if it's a highly lucrative business with a high return on capital, if you can't keep redeploying it, by definition, competition is trying to erode it. Those are the three things that we have over a decade and a half, we've found is hyper consistent in all of our businesses, if those three things exist, I may not be able to pinpoint exactly why this monopoly exists, but I can tell you, you've got a hell of a high quality business on your hands if those three things exist and are observable for a long period of time. How do you think about the management team versus the moat and how do you mix those two together? And you know, what are some of your thoughts on those two kind of areas? Yeah, so uh, there's eight factors in what we do. And there are seven ands, no ors. So yes, this is again, there's slight trade-offs. Nothing is ever perfect. But when you have a portfolio of 20 stocks, which we do, and a holding period is preferably forever, we don't need to literally do anything for the next three to five years to deliver very healthy returns, right? And so part of the benefit of the industrial design and game selection of what we do is we don't have any impetus to trade off or uh, chasing the next you know, uh, shiny thing where we have to make that decision of one against the other. Now, let me answer the question point blank. If you've, if you've found a high quality business and, it's, and the growth algorithm is hitting our cost of capital, how does management team come into this? Uh, there's another series of factors that we look for in our management teams. And I'll tell you by definition, here's the one of the most important ones for all of you guys. Um, as a younger investor, I thought poor quality, poor integrity management teams could be priced. You can't. In my view, you can't. Um, and in the depths of hell, you're going to be faced with questions you really don't want to be facing. So the first and most important thing, we call it a handshake rule. I want to be in a bunker and I want to fight and I want to spend my life with people I admire, respect, right? I, I want to do business with people I want to spend my life with. And so the management teams that we choose for, I'm proud to put in front of any one of my investors, my children, my family. These are people that I like, I learn, are incredibly competitive, hyper aligned, and they're the best of breed. And I think there's upside optionality from, from elite management teams that always seem to find a way to upsize your numbers. They just do the right things at the right time consistently. And so, you know, we look for high quality management, sorry, high quality businesses run by high quality management teams who are aligned, who are highly capable, who are hungry and are highly ethical. And we've got tests for all of that. We don't compromise any of it. And again, when you have a concentrated portfolio that doesn't require any new ideas in any given year, the bar has to be kept high and we know exactly what we're looking for. Does it always happen? No way. But there is no trade-off between a high quality business and a high quality management team in what we do. And I can tell you there's numerous high quality businesses that are run by teams that don't run them as well as they should and are trading at reasonable prices. We don't do that. Because over a long period of time, they're not extracting anywhere close to the value creation that we think can happen. You don't see it in year one. I guarantee you, you'll see it by year two, three, four, or five. And if you're going to spend hundreds of hours or thousands of hours with these type of people, I don't want to compound my time that way. And so there is no trade-off between moat and quality of the business. Um, sorry, uh, between moat and quality of the management team. I believe the two are inseparable and they're two only of eight factors, all of which matter to us. And there's no waiting. We need them all. Yeah, and thank you so much for your time this morning. It was an amazing experience. We really appreciate it. Um, and again, if people want to follow Yen, you should be following Yen on Twitter. You should be following his YouTube channel. He has some amazing presentations that, that are out there for free, and you're definitely going to be learning things once you listen to him. So thank you, Yen, for today. Thank you so much, Ian. Thank you, Mike, and have a, have a great day. This has been an amazing conference, and uh, Dennis is up next, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to learning from him too. Thanks, guys. Be well.